Let's lift up our hands. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you speak today. Supply grace to speak as an oracle. Supply revelation, knowledge, and understanding to every heart. Lord, deepen our faith. Broaden our love. Cause us to know the essence of the faith you have called us to. And supply that your energy, that your grace to act accordingly. That gives strength for the day of adversity. Father, we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord, because you have blessed this meeting this morning with your presence. Thank you, Lord, because you are here. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's um, good to see you all today. I hope you've had a good week. Praise God. Jeremiah chapter 29. I hope to finish up the series today because today I want to focus straight on things that pertain to being led, how God leads us to fulfill um, his plans for our lives. Hallelujah. So, like I said, like I said in the previous weeks that, you know, it is important for us to understand the broad view, the big picture of what the purpose of God for us looks like. It's important for us to understand the broad view, the big picture of what the purpose of God for us looks like so that when we begin to cone down into the specifics of how God leads us, right? When we begin to cone down into the specifics of how God leads us, um, we would understand properly because you cannot talk about God leading us when you're already outside of the big plan. Praise God. You know, you can, when you are even outside of the boundaries of his will, you need to even know what the boundaries are so that when you are now within the boundaries, you can now pinpoint the exact place that you should be. So that's why the last three Sundays I, I, I tried, as the Lord helped me, to try to explain to you what the boundaries are for you to know what the big picture is. If you don't know what the big picture is, you would miss it. And I'm so happy from the responses of this morning that you know, a lot of people are getting it. If not everybody, I sincerely hope that everybody is getting it. But at least a lot of people, it was very encouraging to hear all these um, answers. And it's good that we understand all these things. Hallelujah. You know, so our anchor scriptures from Jeremiah 20, 29 and the other scriptures that show that we are exiles in this world. as Philippians 3, 20, Hebrews, 3, um, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 11, 13, and um, what was the last one? First Peter 2, 1, 17, and First, First Peter 2, um, 2, 12, right? Hallelujah. Praise God. First Peter 2, 2, all right? So... You know, we've been, let's just read Jeremiah 29 again, right? Let's just read it to the end. And we said, you know, we began to explain that Jeremiah 29 is, you know, it's, um, it's a type and shadow of sorts. It is God, it was something that was written down to instruct us, for us to really understand the big picture. And we said we can learn with the eyes of, you know, the, the epistles. We can look at what Jeremiah was saying through the eyes of the epistles and see how this injunction, though speaking to the Israelites, has imports for describing our time on the earth. Hallelujah. Jeremiah was speaking to the Israelites but for our instruction. Hallelujah. He was speaking to the Israelites but for our instruction. And he instructed us for us to understand, and the, as the apostles also helped us to understand, that we are exiles in this world. We are exiles in this world. In fact, there was, there's a whole time that I could have gone, going to Jeremiah, I'm going to the book of Revelation, talking about Babylon and everything, but I didn't want to go there before I get too spooky. You understand what I'm saying here? So, because, I mean, that Babylon matter, if someone wants to just, you know, talk about it, there's a lot to say about Babylon. Hallelujah. But you've gotten the point, isn't it? Yeah, so, you know, let's read it. Jeremiah 20, 29 from verse 4. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And I was explaining for you that what it means to be banished, speaking, looking at it, our, the instruction we can get from this is a type that also, you know, that also coheres with what the Lord did to Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden when he banished them from Jerusalem, when he took them out of Jerusalem, out of, out of the Garden of Eden, which is paradise, which is supposed to be the new Jerusalem, as we see from Revelation chapter 21. And God banished them out of that into Babylon. And it now says in Babylon, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters, Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yet yeah, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you, um, to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
And I, you know, I try to I try to explain that if anybody tells you that God has no plan with respect to your conduct in Babylon, to respect with respect to your time in Babylon, with respect to building houses, you know, building gardens and vineyards and eating what they produce, hallelujah, getting married and having children and praying for the peace of Babylon where you are, the person is telling you lies. And indeed and legitimately, there was a time when this excess was prevalent. There was a time when the Holiness Pentecostal movement, um, everybody knows that I am, I don't have too much issues with them. So I can mention that I said, not be like as if I'm beefing them, you understand? Eh? So I can say it's because you know I don't have a eh? hair. So, right, there was a time, you know, a, few, a couple of years back, 30, 40 years ago, when the Holiness Pentecostal movement went so far and they would have said things like, all these things don't matter. And you still hear flashes of such things today when people say things like, the only thing that really matters is ministry, don't, any other thing apart from ministry, God doesn't have a plan for it and all that. Jeremiah said the person is telling you what? And he says, you are the one encouraging them to tell you lies. He said, they are among you to deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that you are encouraging them to have. Itchy ears draws lies. Itchy ears attracts and pulls out lies from ministers. Praise God. Itchy ears pulls out lies from ministers. I'm no minister is immune. If you stay along itchy-eared people long enough, they will change you. If you stay among itchy-eared people long enough, they will change you. If people in this church deliberately and slowly, it doesn't show in one month, doesn't show in two months, but in over the space of a year, you guys respond more to certain messages. I will not know when I'll find myself touching on those matters more. If you guys are asking questions concerning a particular part all the time, there's a particular thing that you guys are always responding to. If there's a particular type of message that I notice that you guys are, that's what you tell me, you bless me, sir. This one bless me, sir. This is the one that blessed me. You notice that you want to bless your people. <laughs> so you'll find yourself teaching it over time. Hallelujah. you find yourself becoming more emphatic about those things over time. And that's why actually, let me not go into all that. But that's why church governance is very important. Let me just say this, by the way. Church governance is very, very important. The structure that you put in church to help God's people not to be misled by people who are not the shepherd, but at the same time making sure that the, the under-shepherd, I like one of my pastor friends, that that puts it, he says, as your under-shepherd. <laughs> I like it. Right? You have to help the, because Jesus is our shepherd, amen? And the sheep know his voice, all right? So, as the under-shepherd, the under-shepherd's job is to lead the church. That's why he was given as a gift to God's people, to help them to build them up to the come to knowledge of Christ. At the same time, the under-shepherd must be protected so that the sheep don't carry him into the bush. <laughs> So that's very important, right? Anyway, where was I coming from? The point is, see, um, because you can see I'm starting calmly. Yes. I, I like to start messages calmly. Because every time after a message, I'm like, oh my God, I was too harsh today. Next Sunday, I'm going to be calm. So I came up here saying, Lord, help me to be calm. But I cannot give any guarantees <laughs> before the end of the message. <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, if anybody tells you, don't build houses. Don't plant vineyards. God does not care about your material things. The person is lying. The person is deceiving you. It is false piety. It is fake religiousness. It's fake. If anybody tells you that God is agnostic on any matter, the person is lying. The person is not saying the truth. He said, don't listen to those people. They are deceiving you because there is a sense of superiority that comes from thinking like the Gnostics. This world is terrible. This world is bad. Because after Christianity started, there was a whole bunch of people that were called the Gnostics and they, yeah, the, the central idea because there were different versions and different views or different strains of it, right? But basically, the underlying message of Gnosticism is the idea that this world is fundamentally bad. This body is bad. This physical world is bad. In fact, the more physical things come, the, the more corrupted they are. So, and then there are some particular people that have enlightened knowledge. Those people, they are focused on the world to come. They are focused on the world to come. People that are bothered with this physical world are people that are part of this physical world. They are, they are not the enlightened ones. The enlightened ones have a special knowledge. And so these enlightened ones don't usually bother about the things of this world. And it had all kinds of ramifications among the different denominations. It had all kinds of denominations. So there were some Gnostics that were very legalistic because they felt we are the superior ones. So we should not bother with anything in this world. Don't touch anything in this world and everything. And then there were some Gnostics that were very very, very hedonistic. That means they liked a lot of pleasure because they will now say sin is in the body, not in the spirit. So they're the ones that used to have orgies. I'm not joking. They will have orgies and all kinds of, they will do all kinds of nasty things that will say sin is in the body, but our light, our eternal light 
is inside. So he doesn't, he doesn't touch it. Hallelujah. So sin is dead. Praise God. So those are the Gnostic things, right? So if anybody comes and tells you that God doesn't care about the physical things that happens in this world, the person is telling you lies. Jeremiah is very clear about this. This is a very powerful instruction that, and that's why I will do my best to make sure that I never enter into that mistake as much as, you know, I have a lot of, you know, in our context, it's very, very clear the evils that materialism is causing. Materialism is very, the evils of materialism is very clear in our current context. It's very interesting. So, you know, there's that instinct to want to focus on it and all that. But as the Lord helps me, I'll make sure that I never get into that excess and now, you know, tell you lies that God is not bothered. See, it is good that a man can build houses, you know, plant vineyards, marry, um, have children, and participate in the peace of Babylon. It is good. But only to the measure that it does not jeopardize your eternal home. Only to the measure that it does not jeopardize your eternal home. Only to the measure that it does not jeopardize your eternal home. That's why 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3 to 8, Paul was talking to Timothy about widows, and then he now told them, he was talking about widows proper, um, um, particularly, but what his instruction there was of larger importance. He said, any man that can, anyone that does not provide for his family is worse than a what? Infidel. It is good that a man can provide. So it is good that you build houses. It is good that you plant vineyards. It is good that you eat of it. It is a good thing. In Acts 20, verse 32 to 35, Paul was leaving the Ephesian church and he was talking to the elders and he made a statement of pride and dignity. He said, when I was among you, you guys see that my own hands provided for me and for those that were with me. It was a point of pride for a minister of the gospel that I provided with my own hands for myself and for those that were with me. So they were going to do ministry and this whole feeling of this whole, you know, current consensus of which we have to put everything in perspective. But let me just say it. This whole feeling of, you know, people should be a burden to ministry and, you know, wherever I am, people must take care of me and everything and all that. So if I come, I want to come and minister in your place and all that. Everybody I'm coming with, you give all of them hotel rooms, you, you live by plane ticket and all those kinds of things and all that. And, you know, there's a context where there's a way to look at it that it's actually good and actually proper when you do it rightly. But the spirit primarily that a minister should have is that he can provide for himself and those with him. So ideally, right, if I'm going to go and mention the place and I'm going with Russia to the place now, ideally, you want to think like the way Paul thinks, right? My family will not be like, we're going there, two men, right? We're now, and the church does not have much now to put a burden on them. Our first thinking should be, how can we carry ourselves there to be a blessing to you? Not that we're coming to be a burden to wreck you. That you have to start sowing special seed in the church. And people that have not paid school fees have to, you know, be calling the school and be embarrassed and say, don't worry, we'll send the seed to our church. We cannot pay school fees. But before the end of the time, by God's will, God will provide. It's a good thing that you can provide what is necessary. You know, we've talked about this before. Titus chapter 3. Let me just share this one. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verse 14. It is a good thing that you can provide what is good. I love this very much. Titus chapter, chapter 3, verse 14. Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Look at where Paul puts it. Our people, you are God's people. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Do you see that? It is good it is good. Devote yourself to doing what is good. So that you can provide for urgent needs. Another version will say what is meat. You know, English, English really flattens, English really flattens that word urgent down. That's why you see different phrases. So you sometimes will say urgent, another one will say what is meat and everything. It just means what is necessary. The things that are good, the things that are required for us to live dignified lives. For us to live with the respect of the world. Like Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 3. Right, the things that you require to, First Thessalonians chapter 4, the things that you require to live a dignified life so that the world can, you know, you can live independent and self-sufficient. It is good to devote yourself to those things so that you can provide what is meat, meat. And so that you don't live unproductive lives. So that you are not just in Babylon and wasting away. God is the one that puts capacities and faculties inside of you so that, I know I sound like a prospective, I now dress like it again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried as I'm saying it. 
That's why I will not say my life now. My purpose in life is making money. I hope I, I didn't preach three mess, three parts for nothing. Hallelujah. See, I can't help you more than this. It's the only spirit that will do the rest. You know the way people are. When you start emphasizing something, they just think that's the only message. Anyway, I can't help you more than this. If you don't listen to the first three parts, you now you just want to run into, into the world. You're on your own. Hallelujah. The, the, my sheep know my voice. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Anyway, it is good. God is the one that puts faculties inside of you. God is the one that puts things inside of you so that you can do what is meet, so that you can provide what is urgent, so that you can have a dignified life. And a dignified life is not about the scale of money that you have. The one that the Lord gave one talent had a dignified life. The one that had five talents had a what? Dignified life. Everyone will have what they need to be self-sufficient. You know, this is something I cannot go too much into and all that, but if, if, if you don't, if what I've said now has pricked your interest and you don't really fully understand what I've said, those that have been here for a while understand what I'm saying, take, pick the series on laying up gold as dust and listen to it till you understand what we're talking about. Be, living a dignified life is a mix of being content, you understand? Being content and living within your means. Praise God. Church, are we together? So, in this world, exert yourself do as much as righteousness allows. Alright? Build houses as much as righteousness allows. Plant vineyards as much as righteousness allows. Marry as much as righteousness allows. And righteousness allows how many? Amen. Have as many as righteousness what allows. And participate in the peace of Babylon as much as righteousness allows. There are some activism. You say they are oppressing these people. They are oppressing these people. You now want to, let's pray for the peace of Babylon. Pastor Sam has said, be involved in the peace of Babylon. Certain groups are being marginalized. They don't have peace. I want to participate in the peace. Then you now start activating peace and forget they are going to Jerusalem. There's a, there are some levels of activism that you do that righteousness does not allow. Because that activism in particular is very deceptive. You feel like as if you are doing something good. You are part of something good. You are helping people. And then the activism will now take you to hell. There's amount of activism that righteousness allows. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? When I go on, you understand better. Praise God. So I think I've, I've said enough on that, right? So it is good that you meet. It's good that, you know, we do all these things. It is good. It's good. I don't expect any one of you to be idle. I don't expect any of you to be idle. Say, so once you be productive, I don't expect anybody to be idle. I don't expect any of you to not be maximizing all your abilities. I don't expect you to be unproductive in any sense. Everything that you are able to do, exert yourself within the confines of what God permits. And this is something else that I should stress. There's no way I can finish this thing today. There's no way. This is, there's no way. This is another thing that you should stress. And, and, and you know, we begin to go into it now, you begin to see that you must understand, and actually that's what I want to focus on now, is that, see, there is a specific dimension Hey God, I beg. <laughs> there is a specific, there is no way around this. That's the only one that's called. Just take it like that, right? There is a specific dimension to God's plan for your life. All of us are in Babylon, but all of us will not build us on top of each other on the same spot. You will not be in the same place inside Babylon, isn't it? All of us will not be born at the same time in Babylon. All of us will not be born around the same kinds of people in Babylon. So there is a specific way, there is a specific how to go about it in your individual lives. And, you know, on the surface, let me just begin to say that, and that is the reason why, 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 a, church that has, why a church that has a very big God theology will be, believe so much in the sovereignty of God in accordance with the way the Bible describes God, which is that God is our king. We believe so much that God is in control as a church. And that is the reason why I cannot teach you that there is certain things that God cannot do in your life materially. It is because the master was sovereign that he gave one five talents. So I cannot come and tell you because I'm used to seeing people that have one that are not materialistic and say, God can never give any of you five. And I've been saying these things and you'll bear me witness. I've been saying these things. Some of you, the honest truth is that some of you may be billionaires. But it's not all of you that will be billionaires. It's not a cause. I want you to hear the truth now and settle your mind. What I can assure you is that God will never leave any of you destitute. 
Except it's a matter of persecution for the sake of the gospel. Do you understand that they take your house or something here? God will not leave any of you destitute. He's the one that looks at sparrows. He will take care of you. But not all of you will have five talents. Not everybody will have two. Some people will have one. It's called the sovereignty of God. Because there's a way that people preach this God divine provision that actually does injury to our to a proper doctrine of God. You make people feel like as if any kind of socioeconomic status is attainable to anybody. But in practice, you know there's something fundamentally wrong with it. Not everybody will be born to the same background. Not everybody will be born to the same kind of family. Not everybody will be born in the same place. What matters is that what the Lord has committed into your hand, what are you doing with it? Make the best of what the Lord has given you. That's what is your business. Your business is to make the best with what God has given you. And there are some people that the Lord in his, in his will, in his sovereignty will say, I gave you one, but that's one. I will leave, lead it to turn to five. Do you understand what I'm saying? Guys, listen to me. I was in a conversation yesterday with someone. And it's good to always say the truth, even if you don't yet have testimonies to prove it. Because when the testimonies that come in, it gives you more encouragement. I talked to someone yesterday. Now, I don't know where to put materially what he has earned in scale of talents, all right? But I know it's more than two. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's more than two. <laughs> yeah, I know it's more than two. And he's young, he's not even 30 yet. He's a Christian. His best preachers, his best preachers are Vodibucham and Paul Walker, Paul Washer. That is his favorite preacher, Sam Pastor Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> generous and you know everything and, and all that. Proper child of God. So when we talk about how he got saved and everything, I was like, God, God, this thing is not fair. Why do you <laughs> why do you call some people like this? The story was very, very funny. It was misbehaving. He was behaving in school, smoking Igbo and doing all kinds of things and everything. And one day, there was one Yahoo boy that smokes Igbo that always sleeps around. That called him and said, bro, this life you're living is not good. <laughs> <laughs> See, my sheep know my voice. If God uses a donkey, just take it like that. He said, a proper bad boy, a Yahoo boy, smoking Igbo, smoking Igbo, say, yeah, this life you're living is not good. We have to call your parents. And they called his brain. My parents came and father opened John and said, see, there's a narrow way on the broad way. Choose the narrow way. And he broke down and started crying. My sheep know my voice. Oh. Hmm. And then, you know, came and his story is very, very interesting and everything. And one of the funny things is that, see, I, you know, when I'm telling you that someone has more than two talents, I know what I'm saying. And then, now we're going to talk about how they say, everybody now, everybody's going to recognize and everything. His, his own plan in life is to be as low-key as possible so that nobody can ever recognize. Everything is doing, nobody will know. But when you get close, you will now know. <laughs> you understand? Everybody's now calling him to say, ah, how are you doing this? You know, that, you know the way our people are. Everybody now, the churches are now inviting you, come and talk to us, come and tell us. He said, I will not lie to you. I don't know how I did it. I cannot take credit for anything. I was working pro bono. They said, come and do this work. Began to do the work. Made some money. Got an idea and said, let me do this. In doing this, met some people. That not, they said there was no plan. There was no, in two years time. <laughs> like, no, nothing. <laughs> he said, if anybody, he said there were some things that came that he did not even know what they would be useful for. He was buying a microfinance bank in the plan of doing something else and then, down the line, God now brought something else that that microfinance bank opened a way for. Let me not go into them not stuck now. Because I know some of those eyes already open. Those that the demon is still, is still doing that. <laughs> eyes already open. Let me not go into all that. Let me not talk too much. He said, I don't know how I did it. I said, God, this one is five talents. God didn't ask for it. Listen to me. Not all of us will be like that. But the one that God has given you, be faithful with it. You will not lack. You will not beg. You will be self-dignified. You will not have to rely on anybody and people will respect you. But not everybody will be a billionaire. Not everybody will be a millionaire. 
Not everybody will be. And so this is where God actually has a specific plan for each and every one of us. This is why in a real church of Christ, it is very possible that such people will be in an assembly like that. And there will be no sense of superiority. And people that have one talent will be in such an environment and there will be no sense of inferiority. This is the reason why. Understanding that God has a different plan for each and every one of us. That is the simple truth. God is in control and he knows what he's doing. He's the God that reigns in the affairs of men. What that means? He reigns in the affairs of men. That's why you can't be jealous. That's why you can't be envying everybody. Your question should be, God, what do you want me to do? The greatest misery you can give yourself in this world is to begin to rate yourself by how much money you have. Say, God, my life is not going well. See, my friend has more money. I pity you. Let me tell you the truth. It won't solve your problem if you begin to write down confessions. In the next 20 years, I'll be this. And let's know that you're just, you're just multiplying your sorrow. That is the simple truth. I said I'll be gentle to you, God. <laughs> you're just multiplying your sorrow. The question should be, and we're going to look into that now. The question is, Lord, what is your own plan for me? Someone said something that was very, very instructive. Right now, there is a strain of this jackpot thing that is actually a, a competition, a socioeconomic class thing. There are some people that really don't need to go, but everybody in their social class is going, and so they want to go to. This thing is becoming a class thing. Our quantity law. Just like what I'm saying to you. So there's a specific how for how God wants things to be. You cannot question your maker and say, Lord, why did you make me like this? That's another thing. Be careful. You know, it's from joke that some terrible things start. It's from clapping that dance comes. It's from murmuring that blasphemy starts. There are certain jokes. When you're making those jokes, be careful and be self-aware. Be careful and be self-aware. Say, God, am I a spoon? Some people are born to Dangote's family. God, when you hear some stories, say, God, am I a spoon? And everything. See, I, you cannot ask your maker, why did you make me in Nigeria? Why were my parents born in Nigeria? You can't. You see how some countries are enjoying and everything, and maybe you hear someone that has located there is telling you how things work in that country, or you mistakenly travel small, and then you see how things are coming. Now say, God, why did you make me in this country? <laughs> Be careful. Galatians chapter 6. Something instructive here that Paul was speaking. Galatians chapter 6 from verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in his sin, you who live by the Spirit should carry, should restore the person gently, but watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens in this way, will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something, when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Do you see that? Each one should test their own actions. Then they may take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to who? Someone else. So there is a part of our Christianity, there is a dimension of our Christianity that you cannot compare yourself to someone else. It is your own burden. And so you will take pride in your own alone. That means your, your sense of fulfillment, the word pride there, obviously, you understand, is not pride. Eh? The, word, the, sense, the, the sense of self-fulfillment, the sense of personal dignity that you will have will not be based on the fact that you have some friends that moved to America and... Um, guys, please, if I use your example sometimes, just know it's from a place of love, right? So, because that's what comes to my mind, but don't let me stop the message ahead, right? If you have some friends that they move abroad and they're now working in KPMG in America and you are hearing how much they are earning or you have a friend that has moved abroad and they're working in McKenzie and you know how much they are earning, it is not something that you now use to say it works both ways. You don't use that as a sense, as a way to make yourself feel less. You take pride in your own work. If you were born in Abuli Egba, you take pride in the fact that in Abuli Egba, this is what God gave me and I did it well. 
In the same way, if you are a Mackenzie, you don't look at those in Nigeria and say, ha, ha, ha. yes, some of us are good. Do you understand that? Any sense of pride that comes from a place of comparison with another person's situation is not of God. Every sense of satisfaction that comes from a place of comparison with another person's situation is not from God. It is not another person's situation that makes you know you are doing right or you are doing wrong. Your exam script is not another person's paper. It is what your commanding officer says. Can you use another person's exam um, answer sheet in the exam or to, to, to mark your own script? Who marks your script? <laughs> if you don't know, you see, you're writing an exam, you see someone's multiple choice, you, you notice that what you're shading, it looks different from what that guy is saying, God, I beg. <laughs> With that shade. You will now finish, and you now go that one will do look back. Church, I get what I'm saying. It's not the person sitting next to you that determines how right what you are shading is. It's the examiner that determines. So you take pride in your own work. Verse 5 says, For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the world should be able to go through the instruction and all that. So look at verse 5. It says, For each one should carry their own. So you take pride in yourself alone. Without comparing yourself to someone else, carry your own load. Everybody has their own load. Carry your own. Carry your own. There is some burden that comes with having plenty of money that you that has one talent will never know. Thank God for it. And there are some privileges that come with having five talents. There are some material comforts that come with having five talents. Fine. I'm happy for you. But it's not as if I'm hungry. I have clothes to wear. That's just so. I so. get what I'm saying to you. <laughs> there are some burdens. There are certain vices that are, that are the vice of the rich. If you don't have plenty of money, you cannot have those problems. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. There are some problems that are for rich people. There are some issues that are for rich people. In the same way, you take pride in yourself. Because everybody's burden, everybody's load is what? Different. So, there is a specific way that God deals with you. There's actually a specific way. Because I know two of us are born at the same time, to the same family, to the same place. Even if you are identical twins, you turn out and they grow up, you find out that they, they are two different people. Hallelujah. Church, all together. That's why Philippians chapter 2, verse, chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, we know this story. You know, he says that even in my absence, continue to imitate what I do, and, you know, God is one that works on all to will and to do of his good pressure, so that everyone should work out their own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. It's very interesting that Paul uses that word, work out your own salvation. There is a way that you will conduct yourself. There is a way that you will conduct yourself. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, the Bible tells us that Paul and some elders in the church were gathered together and they were praying unto the Lord and the Holy Spirit spoke and says, Separate unto me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have what called them to do. They were gathered together and says, Separate. So there has never been a time that two people will do exactly identically the same thing at the same point at the same time. There's a place that God has for you. There's something specific that God wants you to do. Church, all together. Do you understand that? So that's why in Galatians chapter 2, be writing the scripture and writing them now. I have a lot to say. Galatians chapter 2, verse 6 to 9, Paul began to talk to the writer of the Galatians, talking about how that God who was mighty in me to the, to the Gentiles was also effective in Paul to the Jewish people. God was mighty in me to the Gentiles was also effective in Paul to the Jewish people. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter, chapter 2, verse 6 to 9. Praise God. Letting you know that there is even a way that God was dealing among the apostles, even among the apostles. There is a way that God was dealing with them individually. When he rose and they all saw him, he said, going you to the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing him in the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, I will be with you even to the end of the age. And then, when he's now instructing each of them, he begins to deal with them individually. No two of them died exactly the same way. No two of them had the identical course through ministry. Some of them died very early. Some of them, you know, you understand? James, he just, Jesus, Bruce, he just, just started. Bam. Some people, till the end. Some people nearly entered the second century. And they were all apostles together. That's what I'm saying. 
Not where it's happening. Look at this. Acts chapter 17. This one is very interesting. It makes the points very well. Acts chapter 17 verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Acts chapter 17 verse 24. Verse 25 now says, And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. Do you see that? He said, he, even though he made all the nations from one man, he said that they should inhabit the whole earth. He said he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. So specific, so unique to each nation. How much more? So even the nations, God has specific plans for them in a sense. He said they are appointed time. So it was God that looked through time and said, there is a time when I have organized that this is when the Assyrians will rise. This is the time when the Babylonians will rise. This is the time when the Greeks will rise. This is the time when the Romans will rise. The Lord's appointed times. So no, God is not agnostic on any matter. He now says, look at that. Look at it. He now says, verse 27. God did this so that they will seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our what? Being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. In him we live and move and have our being. So even our daily lives are in him. In him we live and move and have our being. So even our daily lives are in him. Even our daily lives are in him. This whole idea of um, God doesn't really care about ministry. Um, God doesn't really care about our lives. He's focused on ministry. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. So, as individuals, there's a specific way that God, there's a specific how for how you conduct your life. There's a specific how for how you conduct your life. And so this is how, so in following God's plan, now that I've given you the general boundaries, you are not outside of it, right? You are inside of the boundary. So, you know, uh -huh. so now finding your exact space, please, inside of this um, boundary that, G that the word of God has earmarked for us, that's what I want to talk to you about. So it's going to be a more practical message. It's, if you, it's, you know, this is more practical theology. Hallelujah. Praise God. So this is more practical theology that you have a specific place and these are, you know, things that will, will we're going to talk about. Hallelujah. So the first thing I, I want to make clear to you, I have five things I want to make clear. There's no way I can finish today. It's fine. This is the Lord's, Lord is at work. Hallelujah. The first thing I'd like to make plan to you today is that with respect to your God's specific plan for you, right? So the question now is, okay, I know that I'm meant to be in Babylon and it's good for me to exercise myself only to the measure that righteousness allows. So in Babylon, I will build houses, I will plant vineyards, I will marry, give my children in marriage, participate in the peace of Babylon and all that, right? I will do that. But where in Babylon should I build my house? Who in Babylon should I marry? Among the children of God, you understand? <laughs> Who among the children of God in Babylon should I marry? Where should I plant my vineyard? It's not just told you now that everybody has a specific place. You can't just pick any land in Babylon. God is that what we're hearing now is that God actually is deliberate about it. So, God, how do I do about it? Where do I plant my vineyard? Who should I marry? When I'm talking about the peace of Babylon, which parts, which area should I focus on? What are the things I should do? What that means like for us in our particular point, because this is practical, I have to be practical. I have to give practical examples. Lord, what should I do next? Should I go for my masters or should I continue to work? Lord, there are three people that I like or three people like me. Which of them should I pick? You know, it's not the word of God I will tell you. You understand that, right? Unless you want to exegete the scripture, this is another thing that you should know. We'll talk to you, we'll talk about it now. And this is why, see, there's a living Christianity. And don't fall into a dead Christianity. There's a living Christianity where God is ordering your daily movements. In Him, we move and move and what? Have our being. So God can actually direct you on these matters. We're going to look at it. God directs you on these matters. God ministers to your heart, God speaks to you concerning these matters in a way that the word of God has not made provision for. I mean, in a specific sense. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Because if you want to look for those specific answers in the scriptures, you will ICG scriptures. Let me see this now. 
Look through the book of Acts. Look at the examples that we saw. Did Paul, when they were praying and God was setting apart Paul and Barnabas, did you see the prophet say, and the book of Isaiah says, Isaiah you have called, therefore I have called Paul. Did you see that? What did they say? The Holy Spirit said, if you look into the scriptures and you see yourself, they are plain. <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying to you? When you look at the scriptures, you see instructions for how you should conduct your life. When you look at the scriptures, you see, and we are going to talk about how God actually leads us and ministers to us in a specific way. You don't get it confused because one of the popular things that one of the popular things that one man started in the late uh, 19th century was this whole idea that there's a deeper revelation of God's word that is specific to only you, that other people will not see. And I'm sure many of you will have heard it before. He said, look into your word and see your word. See your rema. When the word comes alive and it refers to you. And that's why both of us can be reading the Bible together and both of us can be having different results. Because I have seen the word and you have not. See, there's a level of the word that is for doctrine and systematic theology. But there's also another level that is the Lord speaking to you and the word is coming alive. You need to see yourself in the word. And I remember when I was in school, I was the president of all the Christians in UI. And I was reading the book of Psalm 39. And I saw, I have seen my son David. I have called him and I counseled David and put I have seen my son Samuel. Said the Lord has said, God has forgiven me. Laugh at me. But I know my God has forgiven me. No. That's how heresies start. The only person that can you say, and the Lord, the Bible tells us that Jesus went into the synagogue on that special day and he looked in the scripture and he saw what was written concerning him. So you two must see what is concerning or God. You are not Jesus. Jesus is the Logos. All things were written and presenting him. It was fitting and proper that when he looks into the Bible, he will see himself, not Emmanuel. What is it? <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying to you? He saw concerning himself because the prophets were speaking ahead of him. Not you. When God wants to order yourself to your specific things, there is another way he will tell you. I will show you. Do you understand that? There are other ways it, and it's well described. It is well evidenced in the scriptures. Paul did not need to, need to start reading the book of Jeremiah and twisting it and destroying Jeremiah's message and say, I read the book of Jeremiah and the way Jeremiah was talking, he was saying there was a, there was a, there was a river and it flew and he now said that means that I saw the word minister to me. It means I should not go to Macedonia yet. God just showed him in a dream and that was the end. That's all. The way will come there, all right? So let me just not jump ahead of myself, all right? So, you need to know how God leads us in individual ways, right? Without destroying anything, without leading ourselves into things that can, you know, cause problems for us. There's a way that God leads us specifically, and that's what we're going to talk about today and next week, Sunday. The first thing, there are five things I have in mind. That, the Lord, that I believe the Lord has shown me. I, I believe that will be useful for you. The first thing that you should be well aware of is this. You should have a general sense of the direction of God's plan for your life. A general sense. And I use that word particularly, and I'm using that word particularly. You should have a general sense of that direction of God's plan for your life. That God's plan for your own life, right? Have a general sense of that direction. And what I mean is this. Is that, and that general sense of that direction can come in two ways. It can come as a pure desire, as a pure innate desire, as a man that is regenerated in Christ. As a man that is regenerated in Christ, as a man that has the Holy Spirit, it can come as a pure desire. There's a lot of scriptures that are that are recurring and of recurring emphasis that I will talk about later, and we'll see this. But just follow me, right? I'll show you. The Bible says that he has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So the Holy Spirit is inside of us. The Holy Spirit is in our hearts. By reason of that, because his law is also now in our hearts, our hearts are now tender to God. The things that pertain to us can come, the awareness of it has come as a pure desire. As a pure desire. As a pure body. As a pure desire. 
So it is not out of place. And I'm just using the examples that are coming to mind, right? Readily. It is not out of place for you that while you are young, you, you find out that I desire to minister the gospel strongly. I desire to minister the gospel. It is not out of place. It is a pure desire. It is a good desire. Church, are we together? When it is time for you to start getting married, you can have a pure desire that I want to get married. And all these particular things, even into more specific things, you can have a pure desire and say, I want to go into this particular vocation. You just have a general sense of it, that these are the kinds of things that I want to do. The kind of talents and giftings that you have are not really relevant. Because sometimes when it seems like as if God is sending you in a particular direction, it feels like as if you don't have the gifts for it. And there's sometimes that you have gifts and you think that those gifts are the proof that you should go in a particular direction and it doesn't really follow. What I mean to say is this. The fact that you are singing, that you can sing, does not mean you're going to be a musician. It just means you'll sing for your wife. <laughs> yes. The fact that when you're in secondary school, you could play football does not mean you'll be a footballer. It just means in brothers' meeting, when we're having football, it's you that will be winning the cup. That's it. And there are some times that you say, I desire to, I desire to go into this thing. And it feels like as if you don't have the ability for it. Have a general sense of it. So it can come as a pure desire, or the Lord can minister it to your heart as a revelation or through something, whichever. We're going to talk about the forms which God can subjecti subjectively put things in our hearts. We're going to come, come to it. I don't want to jump ahead of my head. So, but just get this first, right? Just get this first. That you can it's good to have a general sense of the direction. A general sense of the direction. They are not lost. They are not lost because it's important for the next thing I'm about to say. But how do you know that this general direction that you have or this revelation that you have in your heart or this pure desire that you have in your heart is of God is that one thing that we can, can tell you from the scriptures that we, you used to know when something is of God is that, let's look at First John chapter 2. This has been a very helpful test, a very helpful heuristic, a very helpful um, system for knowing if a desire is pure, if a sense, general sense of revelation that you're having is pure. First John chapter 2 from verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is the will of God, the things that are of the love of God. And sometimes it can get technical and difficult for you to tell whether this has to do, especially when it comes to our particular work, here is a good heuristic for those that are doing the will of God. Here is a good heuristic. You will not have the lust of the flesh, you will not have the lust of the eyes, and you will not have what? Pride of life. Just again, I'm saying to you. What I mean is this. If in your heart, practical theology, in your heart you say, I have a general sense that I want to be a lawyer. I want to be involved in law. You have that general sense in your mind. But what you are picturing about law is that, ah, I'm going to get plenty of babes. Or you have watched too much Netflix. And you are saying, ah, I'm going to have plenty of money like I have a spectre. Pride of your life. Or something else. That desire is not pure. Remember what we said about purpose. Purpose is what? Doing. So, the general sense that you have is doing something good and virtuous. Not just a general sense of having a certain status. Or everybody hailing you or being famous. What you have, what you have, the general sense you have is something that you want to do that is virtuous. That is how you know that general sense of, you know, that direction specifically for yourself. It's something that you want to do that is what? Virtuous. And that thing that you want to do will not have the pride of life in it, will not have lust of the eyes in it, will not have lust of the flesh in it. I got what I'm saying to you. Did you hear what I just said? Listen, that's the first one. The second one is this. When you have that general direction, the next thing is that you must lose every desire to know every detail 
of how that general direction will play out. All that you need to know is the next step. A lot of people are putting themselves into a lot of existential crisis, worrying and bothering themselves about this general direction. How shall it be? How shall it be? How shall it be? And everything. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. The way Christianity is, and you'll see it now, once you have that general direction, all that you really need is only the next step. What God needs to show you is the next step. You know, I've said I'll, I'll come to how God shows us. Do you understand that? But what you really need is the next step. Many of you, especially young people, you are in different phases of your life. And you, especially for young people, you are usually young, it's very common among young people to find yourself in this phase of life where you feel like as if you're not moving forward, you're not advancing, you're not moving forward, you're not advancing. What am I going to do next year? What is the plan? Can you call, can you call, and all those kinds of things that are bothering you and you don't know what to do. Listen to me, brother, brethren and sister. What you need is the next step. What is the next thing I need to do? Matthew chapter 6. These are some very instructive things. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 says, and when we're praying, when the Lord taught the apostles how to pray, look at something he said, very instructive. He said, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our words. Give us today our words. Look at go scroll, look at that that same chapter. Look at verse thirty three. Verse thirty three. It says, "But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own." Tomorrow will take care of itself. In case you say Jesus is talking as the incarnation, he doesn't, he doesn't understand what, how, what life what we're going through. Let me show you what my, my guy said it. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now listen, you who say tomorrow or tomorrow, um, today or tomorrow, will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? Why? You do not even know what will happen to what? Tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you want to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. The reason why you want to know and plan your entire next year is so that you can have a sense of control over your destiny. The sense of not being in control and God is the one in control is very unsettling. It's very unsettling. It comes from the flesh. That primal need to be in control of your environment so that you can survive. It's a survival mechanism. To be in control of what is happening so that nothing surprising hits you. Because it's the thing that is surprising that can kill you. What you can anticipate will not what? Kill you. But it's of the flesh. For believers, that boasting, that ability to say with confidence that my next one year, I don't plan out. That's how it will be. It's actually of the flesh. It's carnal. James said it is evil. When the Lord said it, he said it in a different way. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Don't worry about tomorrow. What that means is that as you are now, you are before you say, my life is not going listen to me, calm down. What you need to know is the next step I need to take. What you need to know is the next step that you need to take. And number three, let me just quickly say this now and I close. Is, we'll talk about this, we'll continue next week, right? What you need to know is the next step. What you need to know is what is the next thing I need to do now. So we are in a phase of your life where it feels like as if nothing is happening and everything. That's why I start planning that God, people are I'm, I'm, I'm lagging behind. My friends are doing well, fine. I'm not doing fine and everything. And listen, you see, you have a general sense of direction. Next thing you ask yourself is what is the next thing I need to do right now? What should I be doing now that is good? What is the thing that God has put ahead of me that I can take advantage of? And when you begin to think like that, you will find out that every day, there is something good. There is a step that you can make. Every day, the Lord will give to you. Because let me tell you the truth. Eh? Let me even say this now. Let me just close there. We'll continue next week. Listen to me. A major part of the way God directs you is not because over time, because of, you know, you know the way we charismatics are, we, we, we like to be in control and everything. And over time, we've been, we've been taught God's divine leading and God's plan for our life with respect to how God tells you things so that by telling you things, you can now be in control of the outcome. 
So it has been taught like that for so long. God will tell you things. So because you know those things, you can now be in control of the outcome. But listen to me. I don't want to give a rough, um, you know, meaningless estimate. But let me just say it like this. The majority of ways that God will lead you will be by default. What that means is that you will not even know. God will bring it to you and just enter it. Majority of the time, the way God will lead you, he's the one that will bring things to you. So that's why if you are taking everything a day at a time, step by step, what you'll find out that if every day you are giving, you make the best of it. When God, because you cannot grab opportunities with your hand, because God is always the one that will bring it to you. When opportunities come that will open you into where God is taking you to, you will make the best of it because you have practiced making the best of every day. What you need is your daily bread. Don't throw yourself into a confusion and depression because you don't know how the next one year will be. Don't throw yourself. What you need to know is, Lord, I've woken up today. What is the next thing for me to do? So when I wake up, what is the best thing I can do today? Are there job applications that came up? Someone will tell you there's a job application. Make the best of it and give it your best application. Someone comes and tells you that, okay, there's a particular training and all that. You search your spirit, you ask for counsel and they say it's a good training and it will be helpful for the general district. You know what? Make the best. Do you understand what I'm saying? Eh. See, if you do this, eh? one day, people will be asking you how you did it. You will say, I don't know. Because most of the time, look through the examples that are described in the Bible. Did Joseph plan that they will kidnap him? Did Joseph plan that he went to Potiphar's house? Did Joseph plan that he went to prison? But at every point in time, you find yourself in prison. Make the best of that day. So when someone comes to you and says, I have a dream, make the best of that day. Did Esther know? Because these are the examples that you people like. It's your materialistic minds. Eh? These are the examples that you like. Did Esther know that she'll become the queen's wife, the king's wife? Did she know that the, the Yale will, will do something bad? Or oh, sorry, annoy the king? Because me, I don't say it's bad, but you understand. Everybody's culture, they have a culture here. You understand what I'm saying? Did Mordecai know that today or some people are going to plan, plan, plan against the king? He, did the Holy Spirit reveal it to him? But that day, he saw some people now wanted to offend the king. And the Bible says, subject yourself to the men in authority. And he helped to protect and uncover the plots. That was the thing that now made him to be the right hand of the king later on. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? What you need to do is to know the, this, uh, this desire to control your life. is not up to you to control. You did, did you tell God, God, now this prayer I want. Is this country I want? You didn't. So what makes you think now that you're in control of your life? As I keep telling you, there's always a green light until it's a what? Red. What you need to know is the next step. Sufficient for every day is the evil thereof. Don't let anybody bamboozle you with um, this thing and all that and all that. What you need to know is the next step. What you need to know is say, ah, our ministry, was, uh, the ministry going to be in the next 50 years. See, all I know is that we're going to be doing the right things. Let's just preach next Sunday message well. Say, wait, was not, you don't, you've heard that thing before. So our plan is that in the next 20 years, our church will have 50 branches, two jets, <laughs> five helicopters. It's our big, bold vision. Oh, God. Our big, bold vision is that we're preaching the gospel. Let's preach next Sunday message first. <laughs> when this venue is, where you, like, you see what happened in the last venue. Those are the, when we're in Anthony. When it gets to the point, where the thing is not making sense. One hour, 30 minute service is not enough to preach properly. And the place is smelling of rats. Sometimes smell like ego. And <laughs> what you need to know is the words next step. You remember how we came into this place? We did not even know how it would be. He brought one money. We said we cannot pay it. Somehow God provided. We did not know that we were able to say, and we did that. All you need to know is the, you know this thing that we say, have a, have a faith project. I don't say, I know, you know, I don't want to mention. So it's not bad. As we say, all these things, have a faith project. Have a faith project that in the next five years, I'll be kidding, okay, call, listen to me and listen well. If God has used anybody, and that's the funny thing about all these examples. In the whole Old Testament, there are only three. Joseph, Esther, and Daniel. What about the other people? You would know it's them an example. So if you want to use common sense to calculate it, that means out of thousands of us, only three. But everybody wants to be the three. How will he run? Anyway. Go and ask anybody, they will tell you. What you can be sure of is that whenever you want to take a step, God will not allow you to fall. Even if
if something happens and you're the one that missed your way and you remove your eyes from Jesus and you're looking at the winds, before you think he will catch you, you don't understand, you're the child of God. You are a child of God. Child. 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 He's the one that will carry you, he will help you. He will carry you, he will help you. He will direct your steps. Many times when something seems like as if it's not going right, because you believe in the sovereignty of God and God's particularness in your life, see it as training. That's what the writer of Hebrews was saying. If something uncomfortable is going, put it under the balance sheet of chastisement. That's what you do. Because for God to allow it and God is good, then it must mean that that thing will result in good. Do you understand that? That's very simple. If it is painful and my God is good and my God can never change and yet my God allowed it, it must mean that it is working something good. We'll continue next Sunday. Let's burn our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, our Lord, our God and our King, we ask in the name of Jesus that you will bless the work of the hands of your people. That's that which is good. That which is productive, that which is virtuous, that which you have put in your hands, Lord, cause it to prosper in the name of Jesus. Lord, cause your children to never forget your voice. Father, cause them to never be entangled by the affairs of this world. Cause their gaze to never drop from you in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless the hands of your people and bless all that they lay it upon to do. Lord, everyone who feels some turmoil and storms in their hearts, they are anxious about their uncertainties. Lord, the kind of comfort and peace that comes only from your instruction, Lord, grant it to them. Grant it to them. Speak to your people. Speak to their hearts. Lord, let your word come and give peace to their hearts. Direct them on the next step to take. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, because we know that you hold our lives in your hands. Thank you, Lord, because we know that you hold our lives in your hands. Thank you, Lord, because you will never forsake us. Thank you, Lord, because we know we will never be abandoned. Thank you, Lord, because we know we will never be confounded. Thank you, Lord, because we will never be put to shame. Thank you, Lord, because as long as we hold on to you, we will never be put to shame. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we have prayed.